Hello and welcome to Disciples Prosper. Grateful to have you here. This podcast is dedicated to disciples, those that are truth seekers who are seeking to transform their lives and to prosper from the inside out. I'm not talking about dollar signs per se. I'm not talking about having ripped abs per se. I'm not talking about having fame and fortune per se. What I am talking about is aligning your life to correct principles and that enables you to cleanse your inner vessel and it moves outward, moving from your thoughts to your words, to controlling what you allow in with your food, your intake, et cetera, et cetera. And when you live correctly and live according to correct principles, you experience the fruits of it. And the fruits of it are character, perfections, and attributes of Christ. You become like him because you've aligned yourself with these correct principles. Uh, Today, someone who reached out to me and and wanted to hear my story. I mentioned to them that I was going to be speaking uh, shortly. They asked if they could come. I thought, you know, I, I, I could ask, but it was for a speaking engagement for a program called NAMI for family to family. And uh, in that setting, I share my story, my bout with mental illness. And this, this what is to follow is my conversation with this um, young mom. Uh, she, has, uh, she has several children and uh, her youngest is three, oldest is 21. And I'm just super grateful for her vulnerability and her interest in my story and, um, and the hope that it extends to others to show them that despite your real challenges and real situations and real trials that that leave you wondering why me is is it me is it god is it what is it why am i cursed this is a very real situation so if you're not if you're if you're into wanting to prosper and becoming a multimillionaire and and having the things of the world like fame wealth and health you know you pro- you'll probably be better served elsewhere i what i'm going to talk about today is is reality and that is that you and i are real people that have real challenges and one of the things we're going to discuss is the thing of mental illness and you know often you hear there's a stigma about mental illness and people don't want to talk about it or but the reality is more people are affected by mental illness than those of breast cancer and I, I know breast cancer is a very real thing, and but it gets a lot of publicity. And the, the reality is more people are influenced and affected by mental illness. At least I believe those numbers to be true. I, I'm not a stat, statistician. So um, I'm, I'm going to turn the remaining portion of this to a, 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 essentially a an interview, if you will, more. It's a podcast here that we I've invited you to that you're part of now, and it will be published on YouTube as well. And this is a, a real thing. So please put on your your truth seeking minds and be open to a deeper discussion about a deeper real things. I, I use a phrase called um, weightier matters that I extracted from a scriptural reference in the Doctrine and Covenants that often people are concerned about the drops in the bucket rather than the weightier matters of life. They think about the drops rather than the the drops of water rather than the ocean of reality. And the reality is, is that we are given challenges for a reason and they are designed to change our lives and to be stepping stones to draw us closer to God. And we're given that weakness not to be stumbling blocks, though they can be, but to be stepping stones. And we're, I'm going to dive into this, uh, this talk and invite you. If it resonates, if it's, you feel like it gives you a sense of hope, stick through it to the end of this, this conversation. And uh, I'll extend an invitation for us to connect at a deeper level. my promise to you is to continue to produce content 
uh, to make it, it free for everyone. And uh, if it, the whole point, the whole point of everything about prospering, truly prospering for a, as a disciple is to live correct principles. And when you do that, you prosper in every area of your life. Yes, financial prosperity can come. Yes, you can get the, the things of the material things of the world, but we're not talking about, let me put it this way. One of my favorite leaders and apostle, uh, president, he was president at the time when he said this, uh, Elder Uchtdorf of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, he put it this way. He said, all the money in the world won't buy you a loaf of bread in celestial currency. And so I'm not talking about becoming a, a multimillionaire or a billionaire like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, et cetera, et cetera. They're amazing people and they've been making amazing impact in our world, making it more convenient, much like Andrew Carnegie did and others of the past who made things, material things more readily accessible to us and change our and impact our lives in many significant ways. They're, they're making what Steve Jobs calls a dent in the universe, and I'm grateful for their contributions. The reality I'm talking about is like what President Nelson said in his most recent book, that uh, he, as the, the chief apostle in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, his the difference between what he teaches and what you learn in college, for instance, is in college it teaches you how to have a successful career, how to be able to provide for your family, for example, how to make an impact with your talents. And what he's teaching is how to have eternal life, how to live correct principles here that will carry on to the next life. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about disciples prosper. Disciples follow truth, follow light, they live according to the, the light of Christ that's within them, and they are given more of it and more of it. And it ex expands their heart, it expands their thoughts, it purifies their heart, it purifies, purifies their thoughts, and it enables them to transform everything. And for me, uh, for 30 years, I have dedicated my life to the Lord and for 23 of those years, I was debilitated in many regards, but it was a huge blessing to me. And that was with mental illness. And I, I still take medicine for it and I'm still, do, I'm still deal with it. But because of a combination of many factors, it is possible to overcome that weakness and make it a strength, which I have done thanks to the grace of God and his son. So uh, there, there isn't a magic pill that just solves all of your problems and makes it so that you are mentally sane, meant to have a sound mind. But when you combine all of the resources that are available to us today, it is possible to still have mental illness and contribute in the world. For example, um, some of the things I've experienced are take finding the right prescription and the right dosage, which doesn't just happen with, oh, here's one pill and then it's all solved. For me, it took years to find the right dosage and the right amount. So I didn't feel like I was completely sedated, like a walking zombie, but and I could still contribute. And I didn't feel like I had to sleep 10 to 12 hours a day and gain and balloon a lot of weight. So you got to, you got to, that's one thing. Another thing is initially you may need and may continue to need therapy from a professional who knows how, how mental health works, how your chemicals in your body work. And I'm not that specialist. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychologist. I, I have no background in that. And science is not my forte when it comes to that. But what my forte is, is as a disciple of Christ, I have spent 30 years studying his word and striving to live it. And not only just his word from the canonized scripture, but from the best books, self, self improvement books, um, from biography, not so much biographies, but more books that are about um, my favorite author, for example, is James Allen books that talk about seeking truth, seeking, uh, perfection, not perfectionism, but perfection and 
developing as an individual and growing in such a manner that you improve, you make impact in your life and the lives of others. It being enabled to, to serve other people at a higher level. So without further ado, let's dive into this conversation that I had with, with Mandy and I'm grateful for her willingness and, and her to be open and to, to, um, to give me permission to share this, this uh, experience with you. And uh, stick around for afterwards and we'll give that invitation. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Disciples Prosper podcast. Grateful to have Mandy here as a guest. She's accepted my invitation for an impromptu Zoom call. We, uh, we've met on, through Instagram on a direct messaging and she had mentioned to me some some experiences that she has had and some struggles that she's having and has been willing enough to share a portion of her story so that it could open the door for me to, to share mine and see how we can understand one another and come come out prospering, um, spiritually prospering. I'm not talking about dollar signs here. We're talking about eternal life. And um, so before I go on further, please, Mandy, you want to tell me uh, why why'd you reach out and uh, wh- where, where, where are we at? Um, I have just been struggling with the fact that I have someone that's close to me that's struggling with schizophrenia. And so I was like searching for answers, <laughs> like, where am I going to find the answers? You know, I've taken the NAMI class before and I'm like, I still feel lost in all of this and how to best help. And so I saw your, your thing on um, Instagram and I was like, oh, well, what if maybe this has got some answer? <laughs> So I was interested in hearing your story because I'm like, well, that provides some hope that maybe, maybe we can help this loved one get better. Thank you. I, I, I really appreciate that um, opportunity for you following that prompting to reach out. And uh, NAMI is an, an organization that, that helps people. It's a grassroots, no, I'm saying this for those that don't know, the grassroots effort it's nationwide and there's each state has their own chapter if you will and it sounds like you went to a a local chapter and attended the family to family class right Mm -hmm. so in that in that 12 week 12 to 16 week course it's a free program or it's educational you meet with other people that are like what what would you add to your experience uh there was just a broad gamut of mental illness and so um there was a lot that you discussed in there and I, it was a long, like, was it like 12 weeks? So I'm like, I'm not sure that I hit every single lesson. Like I wish I had, but, um, yeah. So, with the, was, so with the family, what's the difference between family to family and peer to peer? So I don't know. I did the family to family and then, um, I did the support group. And I admit I should be better at attending the support group because I only went once, but it's like times are good and I just don't need to be there. And then it's like, okay, times are bad. I should have been going the entire time. (laughs) But, um, so I, I don't know if there is like in my, in my loved ones area, you know, that peer to peer option, I think that part's (sighs) closed down to them. And so it's like, oh, oh dear, he's relying on me coming out with these answers. Yeah, I, I I understand that. So, um, well, first of all, I, I need to applaud you, as I mentioned earlier, for taking the effort to go to that class and to learn and to see how you how you can learn. So, I'll, I'll put another plug in for Nami. Um, is I've had people reach out to me about, you know, what do you do in a mental health crisis situation? What do you do if someone you love, or if it's you personally that struggles with mental illness and I've been on both sides of the equation. I know people that are close to me that have struggled with it, and I have battled with it myself. And so the family to family classes for those that have family members who are struggling with it, and the peer to peer classes for those that actually have the mental illness to go with peers that also have mental illness. I attended both of them because I have experienced both of them. <laughs> 
and my wife and I actually did the first class or the family to family class together. So family to family has, um, they have, a, as I mentioned, a 12 to 16 week class. And the last week of the class, they have a guest speaker come in. And, and I have been a guest speaker for many years now. I come in and tell my story. And I, I tell different areas of my story, depending on the occasion. And, and the, one of the leaders that's dear to me that invites me to come back regularly, she, she's like, okay, what, what, what angle are we going to hit today? She's like, I, I like this angle. I like that angle. Okay. And I was like, I got a new chapter today. <laughs> so um, the, having said that, the, the NAMI experience, um, there are things that you, they don't discuss in NAMI. And that's what the heart of what I would like to get to today. Um, mm -hmm. not, not, NAMI teaches you how to, it has like a system to cope with mental illness and help you to learn how to recover from it. Um, and therapy is another real thing that helps people with mental illness uh, that I have experienced as well. Uh, modern medicine, getting that dialed in, as we mentioned earlier, is a huge thing. And, and, and I mentioned to you as well that it's not just oh, you got the magic pill and you're good. No, you, you got to get the right medicine, the right prescription size, and it takes time. Um, so I have been on medicine since my mid-20s in um, 2000, the year 2000. I, um, I woke up in the state hospital. And I say woke up because I was out of it for, I thought, maybe one or two days. But when I later discovered the huge bill that I had for the hospital stay before I was court ordered to the state hospital, I was shocked. I called them, was that a mistake? I was there for 11 days? Are you kidding me? <laughs> so I was out for almost two weeks before they pinned me to the ground in the state hospital and took a needle and gave me some medicine in the behind. And I woke up in that same hospital um, shortly thereafter and realized, wow, I'm in the state hospital. And I knew where I was, as I had mentioned to you previously, because when I came home from a mission out of Mongolia, someone very dear to me was in the same room, essentially. Maybe not the same patient room, but the same building, the same ambiance, everything. And I had visited him there and marveled at it. And I got a couple notes on this. So when I visited him there, I made some mental notes in my mind's eye. Fresh off the mission, ready to change the world. Felt like I was invincible. I knew I was a son of God. I knew that I had a mission on earth. I, I was ready to conquer it all. And I... I made, I made some, some vows, if you will. One is, I'll never get on medicine. I won't take medicine whatsoever, including aspirin, including whatever. Be Another vow I made is, I'm going to keep reading my scriptures every day. I will keep going to church every day because this was my logic. If they wouldn't have got on the medicine in the first place, they wouldn't have been addicted to it, and it wouldn't have messed up their body. So... I'll just stay away from all medicine and all supplements and all blah, 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 blah. Second, the second idea is, well, the person I was visiting wasn't active in my church, wasn't reading their scriptures, hadn't gone to church for many years. So that must be why he's having these issues. So essentially I did this and within five years, I was arrested and on Temple Square, um, for trespassing and um, this this experience led to me being put in the in the jailhouse and the, um, the experience was very real very raw um, in fact I still have a scar of this scar right here you can see that by the watch mm -hmm. um, it's from the handcuffs when I was being brought in um, so I'll share a, a portion of this story 
But before I do, I, I need to say this. Um, the I don't remember the term for it, but there's training for police officers on how to um, how to handle people with with mental illness that wasn't available at the time. And so, um, what I experienced was pretty raw. Um, and I'm super, super, super grateful that I had that experience because I got the help I needed. And there's no other way I would have gotten that help because I thought I was all that in a bag of chips. So <laughs> let me extract this story a little bit and having set it up. Um, no. So um, I was engaged to a beautiful woman. I'm in my mid-20s. Um, I had come home from the mission. I got engaged in, in, in a junior college. Um, called Ricks College, which is now BYU Idaho, and I ran for student body president. I, there were eight of us that ran for president. I didn't make the cut, um, but five of the eight of us sat on the presidential board afterwards, and we served the the one the gentleman that did win, and um, and the student body. It was an amazing experience, super awesome. So I, I just all I did is I learned to follow correct principles such as how to win friends and influence people. And I marveled at how quickly you could win friends and influence people. And at the end of the day that I, that I, I battled with that because I felt like that was my, per like I was doing that to win friends and influence people rather than having my eyes single to God. And um, so after that experience, I transferred to another university and changed my name. I went by my middle name, which is Einer, and introduced myself as Einer. And this was kind of essentially the beginnings of me going mad. Um, in, retro, in retrospect, I can say that. So while I was in this hospital, or not hospital, excuse me, at this university, I started going by Einer. I started working super early in the morning um, at, at, a, at a local um, franchise company and going to school all day. Um, I stopped dating. Before that, I was a dating machine. I was gregarious. I was all over the place. And then, um, then I almost joined the army towards the end of that time. And I didn't pass the background to check for the top secret clearance. And I therefore um, got burned out. I was running faster and harder than I had strength. And um, I, I, was, I was trying to speak the most perfect language I knew how. If someone would walk by me and say, hey, what's up? I go, oh, I'm doing very well. And you, thank you. Like speaking proper English, trying this idea of perfectionism was very much a part of my life. Uh -huh. Perfectionism, not being perfect, but being perfectionist. Um, so I, after I didn't make that, I, and I withdrew from school to do that, join the army and didn't make the cut. I then transferred with the influence of a good friend, a couple of friends. I moved back to Provo. Um, and began my journey to get into BYU. Fast forward, uh, I'm a BYU. I'm working at BYU, and um, and a student there, engaged to a beautiful woman, driving a fancy car, was fairly cut in physique. Not because I lifted weights or worked out, but because I grew up on a horse ranch when I was a kid, and I thought I was all that. I was the son of God, uh, you know. Life's good. I'm engaged with a beautiful woman. Blah blah blah. Like, I went. I had set my record of 24 dates in 21 days. It was amazing. So I thought, well, I broke up with my fiance and was hospitalized. Um, not too shortly after that, thanks to my ecclesiastical leaders who had reached out um, to the um, BYU psychologists. And they essentially um, came to my home with some police escorts. And I'm, I'm going to skip a lot of details here, but they invited me to, to, to go to the hospital for evaluation. 
Um, I accepted after consulting with my good friend's dad, who was a lawyer, and he said, hey, I advise you to follow their advice and do what they ask. I'm like, okay. I was mm-hmm. hospitalized, and uh, I, w- I, was, I was a bit bonkers in the hospital because when I, on my way into the hospital, I was signed in voluntarily, and I had watched the movie Patch Adams. So I, I thought I signed in voluntarily so I can leave voluntarily. So as on our way to that hospital, I thought to myself, wow, this, there's some conspiracy going on. The church must be in cahoots with the hospital and I'm going to go for some special ordinance or whatever in the hospital. And, that, and it's, it's all part of the plan for me to be glorified. <laughs> These crazy thoughts, right? Right. Mm-hmm. And, and cause I, you've mentioned to me that the person close to you is, is thought that they, you know, essentially that they're, uh, what's the word, uh, a income, not income, like they, they have delusions of being a god mm-hmm. right now, yeah. mm-hmm. something to that effect. So I can relate to that. I totally get it. Um, and on my way after i checked in i gave him my full list of all the different things that i my life has been like all the different times i had any kind of hospitalization whatever i thought this was some kind of test to prepare me for this special ordinance i was going to get well um on our way back into the hospital they put me in a wheelchair and had a couple of security guards and a nurse pushed me i discovered that it occurred to me and dawned on me that. I am not going to a special ordinance. Like I'm on the way to the psych ward. Mm-hmm. So I tried to get up and was invited to sit down. And I said, no, thank you. I signed in voluntarily. I'm leaving. And they said, nope, you can have a seat or we will red card you. I think that's what they called it. And I was like, well, I'm not sitting down. I'm going to walk out of here. I came in voluntarily. I watched Patch Adams. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like that was my ticket out of here or whatever. And um, yeah, so they uh, they tried to wrestle me down. And I'm, as I mentioned, I was fairly uh, in shape and they couldn't do it. And the nurse went in to then grab my leg and trip me up. And I, I, the idea was, oh, well, why don't you just kick her or something? I'm like, no, 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 no. That is not a disciple of Christ. I don't kick people. And um, so I let her and I subdued myself. And she grabbed my leg and I was tripped and taken down. Let's put it that way. And then I was pinned to a, a, a table um, strapped down and had injections given to me and um, essentially sedated me and when I woke up from that um, I was in a pinned room with the padded walls running circles around the furniture like wow. I pardon the, the graphic image here but I grew up on a horse ranch when I was a kid we raised our kitchens it was yeah. like a, a, a a chicken with his head cut off if you've ever seen that before it's yeah. i was just all over the place running around um on a super big high and um mental illness is real people uh, voices are real hallucinations are real uh, people can use the phrase delusional hallucinations and write something off as in, oh, they're just crazy or whatever. But to the person experiencing it, it's very real. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective on that is that we as as sons and daughters of God, um, we... Are beings of light we're spiritual beings and to put it put it put it bluntly the adversary is real 
and the, the, the influence of evil spirits is real. And when you are in those kind of states, you are easily succumbed to such influences. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to pause for a moment there. Not the, like, not the recording, but uh, do you do you feel inclined to, like, do you 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 feel where I'm coming from? Is this relating? Yeah, because I I definitely like see some of the choices that has. You know, like the drug use and, you know, some of the other things that I'm like, wow, that is not the best choices. I can see how it's leading to more psychosis and more hallucinations and more visions and and just, mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and, and for the record, I was clean, temple goer. I didn't do any drugs. I didn't do any alcohol. I had none of that. I read my scriptures daily. I wrote in my journal daily. I went to church and magnified my call weekly. I did. I was a good boy. I did what I was supposed to. And it still happened to me. Right. <laughs> like, um, they, they told me when I was in the hospital that uh, if both your parents have, if one of your parents has mental illness, there's a one in four chance you'll have it. If both of your parents have it, there's a three in four chance you have it. And it usually hits you in your mid twenties. Now, mm-hmm. both of both of my parents were mentally ill. They're both deceased now, um, and they they they're um, amazing people. I'm grateful to have them have having had them as parents because they gave me freedom. They didn't demand anything of me, allowed me to grow in my own way. And um, but they had real struggles, and I believe that they had those struggles to help lay a fertile ground for me to grow and learn how to overcome this and be an influence of helping others to do likewise. Right. So, um, so having shared all of that, um, I feel inclined to, um, to just share this portion of the story. This is just the beginnings of the story, but the long story short is I, I started taking the medicine in the hospital and, um, and from that point I regained sanity again. And they said, you know, here, take this medicine, keep taking it. And, you know, you, you could have other issues if you don't take it anymore. And the, and the, the, the lawyer friend advised me to take the medicine if they prescribed me any. And so I said, I subdued to it. But once I was out of the hospital, no more medicine for me. Because of that vow I had made as a kid. Uh, not as a kid, as a young return missionary. Oh, it's because of the medicine. Mm -hmm. So that lesson was not solidified for me. Like I was on and off, on and on for 10 years. When I say on and off, on for 10 years, pause under doctor supervision, relapse on for 10 years, pause under doctor supervision, relapse. Mm -hmm. And my last relapse um, was in 2020. And um, when I got on the medicine again and waking up in the same state hospital again, um, I recognized that I need to take some medicine to maintain my sanity. And what, there were two reasons why I didn't want to take the medicine. Um, one is the weight gain. And sedation, I'll put those classifications together. Um, and two, I wanted more energy. I wanted to be more engaged. I didn't want to be heavy. I didn't want to be um, obese as I was. Mm-hmm. So I tried getting off more than one on those two occasions I mentioned. Um, and When I woke up that last time, I, I, uh, I was in the state hospital for about six weeks. And when I came home, I came home the day before our sixth child was born. So this whole episode happened, my most recent episode happened while my, my wife was pregnant with our sixth child. And um, I came home a different man. And I, I began to... Um, began to turn to the Lord again in my life. Um, not, 
I, I, I was templed. I, I did everything that I was supposed to, but I recognized the spirit really acknowledged, can't you need to take the medicine? This is, this is a lifelong thing. This is for real. In 23 years, you, you finally get the message. <laughs> and I made that commitment and I thought, and I thought to myself, wow, if I'm going to take, if I'm going to make, take this medicine, then I must, I need to accept the fact that I'm going to be sedated, accept the fact that I'm going to be overweight, accept the fact that this is what I need to do to maintain my sanity. Mm. So I ballooned up in weight again. I'd lost weight when I got off the medicine. I ballooned up in weight, the heaviest I've ever been, almost 288. And, um, as a side effect of that medicine. And then in July of 2021, I decided, you know what? I got to trim down. I got to do something different. So I started watching what I ate better. I got an awesome, solid job as a salesman and uh, returned to my roots of sales and did really well for two years. Uh, the, the family company that brought me in was a huge blessing to my life. They gave me confidence again. I knew I could achieve and grow. And then in, um, in May of this last year, 2023, I had a revelation and because I've been trying to trim down for over 18 months and I got down from 288 down to 254 for six months, up five pounds, down five pounds, up five pounds, five pounds. Yeah, I gained, essentially I gained the weight back on the weekends when I get pizza with my kids. <laughs> Right. So, um, but the revelation was this, if you really want to trim down, I will, I will bless you and I will help you and I will change your life with you, if you do this, if you take accountability and, and accept my support, my love, my power, and I'll, I'll help you transform. So at, in that moment, I took accountability for what I ate when I slept, when I, and just started intermittent fasting, I, I just was really mindful of what I did and I didn't make exceptions on the weekends. And within five weeks, I was down over 20 pounds. Now this part of the story I'm telling, I'm tying back into my messaging, current messaging, um, with being disciples prosper. And, and I'm hoping that it connects with the portion that, that, that we bridged a lot of space. Essentially, in that space of time, I had a lot of ups and downs. And um, but in May of this last year, that's when I, I transformed and I trimmed down the weight. And I was still on the medicine. That's the thing here. I was still on the medicine. I'd been through the therapy years ago, years previously. I remembered what got me healthy before, and I did all those things. And then this new level of accountability was I really wanted to trim down. And then the idea came to my mind that, that Jesus Christ was not a 254 pound salesman. He was a master carpenter. He was fit. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if he had a six pack or not, but um, he, as a, as a man, as a mortal man, he grew in stature, the scriptures tell us. And I, it just dawned on me, like, if I want to emulate him, then I need to do that with my physique too. And I had started a podcast years before that, and it, it changed the name to Jesus is the Mark just a month or two before that, and started thinking about making him the focal point of my life. So um, before I conclude, and open it for some questions you may have. Um, I, I want to say thank you for reaching out to me. Thank you for being an amazing mom. I think the, one of the greatest tendencies as mortals is to beat ourselves up. What could I have done better? If I wouldn't have done this, it's my fault. If blah, 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 blah and we beat ourselves up. And I'm, I testify to you, Mandy, that the choices you have made and who and what has become of you and those that you love 
are part of God's plan, part of his plan of happiness and redemption. And because of Jesus Christ, we have that privilege to, to change and to grow from those trials. And um, I'll conclude with the, the one quote that changed my life after my second, after I was, after I was, um, after I woke up from the state hospital, I took a sabbatical from school. My, I broke up with my fiance before I was hospitalized. My car was impounded and sold while I was in the state hospital for the first time in 2000. No one came to visit me. I thought I was all that and had all these friends. Not one person came to visit me except my parents and my ecclesiastical leaders. And I gained 60 pounds in nine months. So I took a sabbatical from school, moved in with a, a, an old friend from high school, moved to a, a city an hour away, started afresh. Stopped. I went back to work and at a franchise, a local franchise. I had an associate's degree and here I was working in a local franchise. Then I landed a job as a courier and I started pounding books and I took three years listening to books and feeding my mind the best books the best that i could do still going to church still writing in my journal still still magnifying my callings while it's this heavy obese man and then i came across a quote a very real quote that answered my question why god what did i do was it am i cursed you ever felt that? Mm. Maybe your loved one, do you think they may have felt that? I, yeah, I think they have felt that. Mm -hmm. and, and, you, and I thought to myself, what, what did I do? And those were my, kind of my prayers in my heart. Mm -hmm. And then I was reading a book um, by that was compiled by um, Henry B. Eyring, who wasn't an apostle at the time when he compiled it. Um, and it was called On Disciple Scholarship. It was a, a co collection of addresses um, given some of them, I think maybe all of them are at BYU. And one of the first addresses in there was called The Disciple Scholar, written, or it was an address that, that Neil A. Maxwell, Elder Maxwell, gave to BYU honor students on campus. Mm -hmm. And he, um, he said the following. Often, an invitation to greater consecration comes by means of painful personal experience. Should I share that again? Yeah. Often, an invitation to greater consecration comes by means of painful personal experience. When I heard those words, the Spirit lit my soul on fire because it was an answer to the question I had asked for three years. Why me? Mm -hmm. What did I do? <laughs> I've been a good boy. I've kept the commandments. I've lived the best that I know how. How could this happen to me? And what he said is real. That experience, that painful, personal, real experience was an invitation to greater consecration. Are you serious? Like, because the reason why that struck me so deeply in, in part is because I had become fanatical about religion. Right. To the point of madness, to the point right. of being arrested on Temple Square. Mm -hmm. So, I, how does that all connect? 
and the answer after that, after I had that experience, I had been humbled. We learn in the Book of Mormon, in Ether chapter 12, 27, often quoted scripture, that when you come unto Christ, he'll give you weakness. Weakness is a gift. And it doesn't say weaknesses, because <laughs> we all have many weaknesses. He gives us weakness. And what is that weakness? I would propose to you that that weakness is the natural man. And that covers a lot of weaknesses. And he gives it to us so that we'll be humble. And if we're humble, then we'll turn to him and turn that weakness into a strength by exercising faith in him. So I exercised faith in him for three years. This didn't happen overnight. This quote didn't disappear to me and all of a sudden everything's wonderful. It took three years to prepare me for that and 29 years of my life to prepare, or 28 years of my life to prepare me to receive that little nugget. Right. And after I had that and taken that, received that nugget, within three or four months, I was back in school. Within, I started dating again too, I might say. I, and it was amazing. My list of 30 superficial things that I wanted in a future wife, I chiseled down to five things that I needed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I started dating girls that met those five needs instead of quote unquote trophy wives that you know mm-hmm. that I thought all my friends thought was all that like right. what I thought other people perceived and my relationships are lasting longer than 30 days it was amazing <laughs> and so within within a year I was in, back in school met my wife to be married And within three years, I was graduating with university honors from BYU with the help of a boatload of people, including an accommodations program. Like the people that I thought were in a conspiracy to get me, such as doctors, policemen, whoever maybe, they've devoted their entire lives to serving people like me and others so that they can achieve success. So it was it was a reverse of thought like wow they're not out to get me they're actually trying to help me and and when I accepted that because it was an invitation to greater consecration Mm -hmm. my life changed okay I've talked a lot your turn Mandy um I just I'm like well what can I greater consecrate to help this person in return because I realize a lot of this is his agency and his willingness to help himself Mm -hmm. that is an excellent question and when I have spoken in NAMI so many people have that question and the the best answer I can give is twofold number one rather than beat yourself up applaud the fact of where you are turning what direction is your tent facing are we facing babylon and after things and material things and success in this world or is it towards zion and putting becoming of one heart and one mind and having no poor among us so that would be the first question. Is your heart in the right place? And are you are you centered on the on the glory of Heavenly Father? And two, I would be, are you filled with his love? If all things fail except his love. And three, keep doing what you're doing. Loving, serving. Here's and, and, and this is a final thought I'll share on this subject for a moment. Um, for years, when I came home from the mission, I worked on someone that I was very dear to me. And I, I'm like, man, this is the gospel. This is da 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 This is da 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 They had these long discussions. Da, 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 da. Come on, you got to change. 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 And no progress. Then a, a quote from St. Francis of Assisi came up, which was, 
Preach the gospel your whole life, and when necessary, use words. So I stopped doing this to my loved one that I wanted to change and started practicing what I knew love to be. And miracles happened. This loved one that I'm referencing was my dad, who was a returned missionary who went inactive for many years. He's deceased now, and I bless his name and his love. He had the gift of charity. I dare I say better than anyone I know, personally know. And um, and he and my mom were divorced when I was four or five. Well, uh, after I changed my heart and started loving him, um, I invited him to go on a date with my mom again. And they did. Wow. <laughs> That's cool. And my dad said, I want to marry her again. And I said, wow, that's awesome, Dad. Where do you want to get married at? <laughs> and his response was, the temple, of course. <laughs> I stopped trying to change him and started practicing what Jesus Christ said to love one another. That's what a true disciple does, is loves one another. Stopped and started loving. And he, in his own agency, responded. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So often we want people to be held accountable to what we know, that we fail to realize they're accountable to what they know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you live that higher law and you love like you know you should love, instead of, I like what President Nelson said, I think in 1997, men are that they might have joy, not guilt chips. Mm -hmm. And when we just love, it invites people to change. Loving, including our enemies. Um, so, is that helpful? That is helpful. That is. <laughs> The uh, the trite phrase, I never said it would be easy, but it would be worth it, comes to mind. But the thing is, is that Christ did say that it was easy. And, um, but the key component is, do you take his yoke upon you? Because if you, if you try to do it yourself, then it's hard. It's because you're relying on the arm of flesh. Oh, I'm way down. Oh. This is so hard. But if your eye is on the target, on Jesus and being the mark to emulate and the glory of God, not your kingdom, not what will your friends think, not what will your husband think, not what will whoever think. You're loving because that's what your master says to do is to love. That's when miracles happen. Yeah. And I would say more often than not, that's always been the answer I've been given. Love him anyways over the years so, Still so having having shared all of that my second invitation is um for for him and others like him um myself included i i wouldn't have got the help i got unless i was arrested and frankly i had it figured out I remind myself when i say that like i thought when I was a 16 year old thought I knew more than my parents I thought I knew more than my teachers I I wasn't open to it so um, the thing I love about sharing my story in NAMI and in this opportunity is it is my hope that it gives hope to people like you who are family members of loved ones and that it gives hope to those that are struggling with mental illness too to know 
that I've been there before. There is light at the end of the tunnel and that this challenge was given to you because you're a gifted being, both parties. You needed this experience to teach you humility. And we have the choice of, of humility. We can be compelled to humility and we can sometimes repent and sometimes we don't. But if you choose to repent and choose to turn to the Lord and choose to do what you know you should do, including eating right and exercising, um, as well as reading your scriptures, as well as going to church, as well as going to therapy, as well as taking the right medicine, you do the divine laws, you get divine miracles. You tap in to power from on high. And that is the part of the equation that's often taken out of organizations and uh, different kinds of organizations. Great people that have devoted their lives to helping and serving people but they, they're not allowed legally to talk about God. So that is, when you combine them all together, that synergy, you have that all working together, then miracles happen. Then you can go back to the workforce, go back to school, go back to achieving and developing, discovering, developing your talents and go to work. Um, but unless you often it takes to be compelled to humility right so so the final thought on that is my hope is that hearing my story will influence both sides of the equation and i we have six kids we i work work my tail off and um and you know i for example i picked up a side hustle i'm working crazy hours right now and wanting to position myself to serve people so they don't have to go through what I went through and to provide for my family and to be an influence of good. Mm. Final thoughts? I appreciate you sharing it with me. <laughs> It does give me a lot of hope. <laughs> and I hate to be like, okay, it's going to have to be by, you know, forceful humility. But <laughs> I'm like, I just don't see it any other way. But it, it'll it be fine, even if that's what ends up happening. <laughs> Somehow he will get to the other side. So, yeah. That is right. It did, it did. And I, I, I don't wish that on anyone. I don't wish my experience on anyone. But I will tell you, right here looking square in the eyes i'm grateful for those experiences like those experiences brought me closer to him they were stepping stones to draw me closer to him not stumbling blocks but the natural man will tell you they're stumbling blocks oh why how could bad things happen to good people if you're so good and keeping the commandments so well blah 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 blah, blah. why did you have that experience well, you know, the same people say this, gave the same argument about Job. <laughs> you recall that story? Yeah. Hey, if you're such a righteous dude, why is, why'd you lose all your family? Why'd you lose all your land? Why'd you lose this? Why'd you lose that? Well, he began to question you, but he, at the end of the day, he said, if I, if I die and the worms eat my flesh, hey, I will still know my master and you know and the, the, the Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego same thing we're, we're going to go into the fire and this is our testimony and it's immovable but if not mm -hmm. and they and that's when the miracles happen when you when you stand true to what you know to be right and you take accountability and do what you know to be right, that's when miracles can happen. It's by right. obedience that precedes the blessings. Are you praying always? Are you going to the temple regularly? Are you reading your scriptures daily? Like not just reading them, like supping on them, like asking questions with an inquisitive mind. How can I serve my family better or my friends or my neighbors? How can I serve them better as I study this? Like, uh -huh. Do some soul searching, like, where am I? And because you are the only one who can change you. 
Mm. And when, and I promise you this, when you change, it's a, it's a miracle. Other people change. I mean, here, I, 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 this will be, let me do this. Is my, my final thought um, is, uh, so a, a family member, uh, an older family member, um, when she was in her seventies, she used to say something to the effect. Um, do you know why I take my medicine? I don't take my medicine because it makes me feel any better. But because my family treats me better when I take my medicine. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm trying to say from that, extract from that is when you do what you're supposed to do, mm-hmm. when you love, when you are filled with the spirit, have the spirit as a constant companion, ripple effects happen. Mm-hmm. And some people call it vibrations. Some people call it ripple effects. Some people call it, well, I would say you get filled with the love of God. The one thing that never fell up and it permeates and people feel it. Mm-hmm. It's contagious. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I I really appreciate this. And it does help me kind of steer my focus. <laughs> so. The temple is a place of revelation, President Nelson taught. Um, God wants us to be happy. Mm-hmm. And he has prepared. I love how um, Elder, or not Elder, um, Nephi puts it in the Book of Mormon. First Nephi 3, 7. He prepares a way for us to fulfill his commandments. And his commandment was to love even our enemies. And he has prepared a way for us to have joy and happiness despite these painful personal experiences. But it takes humility. It takes taking the yoke of Christ upon you. It's not sitting on a fence post. It's putting that yoke on and walking with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And then you have access to his power and then miracles happen. Okay. Thank you for joining today. And in the experience that I had with Mandy today, it was, it was an impromptu, not premeditated, uh, just share from the heart on both aspects of hers and mine. And It was an opportunity to serve and learn from one another. I'm so, so grateful to Mandy for for sharing that experience with me. And for all of you out there who have real problems and have real situations, real challenges, I suggested to her that the one person you can change is you. And if you would like help changing you, if you would like to book a call with me, I'll put a link here in the bottom and you're welcome to book a call with me. It would be a complimentary call and um, and to see if it would be a match for us to work together. Obviously I can't, I don't have time to meet with a bunch of people and to work with a bunch of people. And I don't have time to work one-on-one with someone for free, um, but I will continue to produce content where I give it away. I, I give away my heart, I give away my experiences, I give away my my life to help serve others that are struggling like I have so that they can catapult to their experience and not take 23 years, for example, to trim down 60 pounds and keep it off um, so that they can push through. For example, someone said to me uh, in, a, in a direct message recently, they said, I'll eventually figure it out in time. And, <laughs> Yeah, you you totally will. You'll figure it out, especially with with God in, in your back and the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's the whole purpose of life is to figure it out with time. But if you if you feel inclined to to catapult things to the next level that much faster, and you're in a position to to compensate for the time that I put on a one on one basis, or I'll ha- also have a group call basis too. Um, then let's connect. Let's let's see if there's a a package that works together for both of us. Uh, your time's valuable, my time's valuable. And um, by by helping me, by 
by paying for the service, actually, it helps position me to be able to produce more content as well. So it's it's a win-win situation if you're in the position. If you're not, continue to visit my content and continue to search, continue to read the best books. Read James Allen, for example. Read the Bhagavad Gita, for example. Read the Book of Mormon, for example. Read the Bible, for example. Not not And don't just read then read and read and read ever learning but never coming to the knowledge of truth. Truth is to receive light and then to live it and see that by living that light, you come to truth. Just like when you plant a seed and it grows and it sprouts and becomes something, you see, oh, that's a XYZ fruit. Likewise, to grow in light and truth means you receive the light and you live it. Then you see the fruits of it. And when you see the fruits of it, you know that it's true because it draws you closer to God or it doesn't. And, and if it doesn't, then push it by the wayside because we're here on earth to learn to lay hold of every good thing and to apply it and to become better and to become a better servant to your, your spouse, to your children, to your community. So when you do this, when you make the lifelong commitment more than a lifelong commitment, when you accept the challenge and take accountability for your choices as a disciple of Christ and strive to live his teachings, he will transform you. And it's going to include, as we mentioned in that call, painful personal experiences. Job wasn't excluded from that party either. And likewise, um, part of turning your life over to him includes being vulnerable. Brene Brown talks extensively on that subject. And it, it not just vulnerable with telling people your challenges, but vulnerable in opening your heart and your mind to God and allowing him to come in and teach you further light and truth. And when he does give you that further light, it purges the darkness from you and enables you to be a better servant, to be a, a happier, more joyful person, despite the challenges. You can still have joy, even when you are challenged. You can still serve other people. And often when you serve other people, despite your challenges, it enables you to push through them so much easier because you know in whom you've entrusted. And it is not the arm of flesh. It is in Christ. And when you take his yoke upon you, literally, I, I mentioned this in the call, take this yoke upon you, you have access to his power, his enabling power to help you move, strengthen your, lengthen your stride, to move further and faster, to run without being weary, to walk and not faint, etc., etc. So I invite you Go ahead and book a call with me and, and see when our schedules can align and let's move forward and, and help one another out. Otherwise, just keep, just keep checking out the content, make some positive feedback. I'm not looking for permission to publish what I'm publishing. I'm speaking from my heart. I'm sharing from my heart to help serve others who have real problems and real challenges and to turn their hearts and their minds to God. It's not about me. It's about him. And I love, love, love the scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants section 59, verse 21, that he that recognizes not his hand, God's hand in all things, that that is the one thing that really gets him cooking. And I invite you to recognize his hand in your life, even with you, with your challenges. And when you turn to him, I promise, 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 when you turn to him in humility, as it teaches in the scriptures, Ether chapter 12, verse 27, as you continue to turn to him, his grace is sufficient to turn your weakness, your challenge, your whatever it may be, to a strength. I promise that. It's so true that you've got to be humble and you've got to turn and come unto Christ. And when you do that, you get access to godly power, the power of godliness. Not just having the form of it, but having the actual power thereof. And the difference is, the form of it is, 
well, in the laws of success of this world, if you live X, Y, Z, you're going to get X, Y, Z results. The law of the farmer, the law of the harvest. Uh, well, that's great. And you can make mega millions of dollars and make a mega massive impact on society. But at the end of the day, what will that do for you in the eternities? As, as my master taught Jesus Christ, that if you gain the whole world of wealth, at the end of the day, what does that do for you if you lose your soul in the process? Or as Paul put it, if you have, and essentially if you have all the gifts of the Spirit and you have revelation and you have, uh, and you have the wealth of this world and you have whatever, if you have everything but you don't have love, what do you have? Because as Moroni I put it in the Book of Mormon, chapter 10, if you don't have love, you don't have it. You have nothing because love is the one thing that faileth not. And I invite you to, to search your heart, search your soul, and allow love to grow. Cease to find fault with one another and love one another. And it's beautiful when you love even your enemies and those that despitefully use you is an invitation for them to change. And you don't have to impose anything on anyone. You simply love them with starting with your thoughts and your heart and your words and then your deeds. And you show forth that love and it transforms you and those that you come in contact with. So thank you again for joining me. If you're in a position to, to book a call and, uh, and get, get started, let's do this. If not, we'll see you on the next video. Have a beautiful day.